All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, I guess. Uh, this is the Platform App Builder Study Group uh, in, in Iowa, Kansas City, Omaha, and one in Chicago. And today's topics are the roll-up summary fields, validation rules, and approval processes. So we'll get, we'll get this kicked off. I'll stop sharing and Tyler, you can go ahead and get some. Um, so one second here. Uh, okay. Uh, just get this bar out of my way. Um, okay, so I had uh, roll up summary fields. So just quick agenda. What is a roll-up summary field? Uh, what are some of the types you can have? Some uh, guidelines and just um, some limitations of them. And then a couple of use cases that I'll also uh, go through. So a roll-up summary field, um, it's a field that calculates values from related records. Um, or such as a related list. You can create a roll-up summary field to display a value in a master record based on values in fields of that detail record or just a count of the amount of records that are in the detail. Um, you have to use a master detail relationship. Um, all of the other relationships you cannot do roll-up summary fields on um, so that you know, goes to show about the fact that, you know, accounts can't be details on uh, records. So you can't really do roll up summary fields like off of accounts. You can put roll up summary fields on accounts. So, um, but uh, some of the types you can do, um, so you can count the number of detail records. So uh, every, um, so if you have a master detail relationship, uh, you can count all of the times that that um, ma uh, master exists on any of the detail records. But you can also do roll-up summaries on certain fields from the detail records. Um, so in, of those um, functions that you can do for uh, on these fields are sum, min, and max. So there's use cases for all three of them. Uh, if you want to see like uh, the highest, um, you know, the highest currency or cost of, you know, some detail record, you could use maximum. But if you want to add up a bunch of stuff, you could use some. Um, or if you just care about how many of an object exists, you can just use the regular count. So some uh, guidance on some of this stuff. So number, currency, and percent fields are the only ones that you can do sums on. Um, but you can also um, use min and max for those, as well as date and date time fields. So date and date time, you can't do sum fields, which is pretty straightforward, as I'm not sure what you would really be counting um, for date fields. Uh, if you have a roll-up summary field, you cannot change that uh, relationship from a master detail to a lookup. It has to remain as a master detail. Uh, one of the other things is that changes to um, the value in a roll-up summary field can trigger assignment rules. So that could be helpful, um, you know, if you have an account that once they hit so many, you know, costs of something. So if you have a roll-up summary field that has a total cost of some products that this account has, if that cost goes above some certain threshold, then you can assign it to, you know, like a manager or something. Um, you can work out some process for that. But yeah, they automatically trigger reassignment rules when that field is changed. Um, if you use roll-up summary fields in any list views or reports, you can't use um, any of those below qualifiers. So the starts with contains, does not contain, includes, excludes, and within. Uh, 
Um, so just a couple of use cases here that I'll also kind of demonstrate. Uh, so you have a custom object invoices that is tied to an account. You need to see how many invoices an account has and you'd like to see this number easily on the account page. So that's one of the um, quick ways to say, okay, so you can do a count rollup summary field uh, that just counts all of the invoices and you can display that field on the account page directly. Another use case, you have a custom object invoices tied to an account. Each invoice has a cost field on it. You need to see the total cost for all the invoices an account has. You'd like to see the number easily on the account page. So again, you can create a uh, roll-up summary on the account, but instead of doing a count of invoices, you can do a sum of that cost field. And so just to um, kind of show this a bit. So I have these two objects, accounts and invoices. And so if I were to go to my account here um, and I tried to make a new roll up summary field. Um, so if I were to try to call it invoices, I'm just trying to show something here. Um, so if you notice, I don't have an option to have invoices and that's because I don't have these two objects linked as a master detail relationship. So we'll set up the master detail here. And so we want to relate it to counts. And we'll just leave everything as default. And we'll save. Uh, oh, whoops, I don't think I cleared out this bar out of here. I was going through and doing some of this before, so I didn't actually wind up clearing out this invoice. Um, okay, so let me try that again. Okay, everything is the default for the master detail. There we go. And so now, if I were to go back to my account object, And if I were to try to create a roll-up summary field. Um, so we'll do the first one. So I want to know the total invoices. So now in my summarize objects, I have invoices now as one of the options since I now have that master detail relationship. So I can click invoices and I want to know the total of how many invoices this account has. So I'll just make it account. And I want to include all the records, um, but you can also choose certain criteria. Um, so if you, if this invoice has um, some record or some field on it, uh, let's say an invoice type, um, and you only care about um, a specific type of invoice, you can uh, filter by that certain criteria. But in this case, we'll just use all records. And we'll add it to all the page layouts. Um, and also make the other one that we needed. So again, we'll use a roll up summary. And we'll say, let's call this one total cost of invoices. 
So again, in my summarized object, I want to select invoices. Um, and now in this case, I want to know the total cost of all of the invoices that this account has. So in this case, we'll pick sum. And so now I get to pick a field that I want to aggregate. And so I'll pick my cost field. And again, we'll leave all records included. So add it to all the layouts. And so now I've made my two summary fields on my account. So if we see, if we just look at one of these accounts here, So you see we have zero total invoices and zero total cost of invoices. Now if I were to go to my invoices and let's create a new one that is tied, uh, let's just say um, new computers. Let's say this is $45 and I wanna tie it to this app builder study group account because Terry's buying us all new computers after this. So we'll save that. So now if I were to go back to this account and I've noticed that there is some, uh, it, it says that there can be up to 30 minutes of a delay for roll up summary fields, depending on how many records you have. But I have noticed that there is a slight delay even doing uh, one at a time. But as you see now, these two fields are incremented to show that there's one invoice tied to here and it uh, has a total cost of $45. So that was all that I had to uh, present. I don't know if anyone has questions or Terry, Carla, anything that I might have missed. Uh, what's the total number of roll up summaries you can have on an object? Uh, I believe it was uh, 200, is that right? 25. Or 25, yeah. 25. Sorry, 100. <laughs> 25. That would be a lot of summary. Data. <laughs> yeah. And that, that is one that you could ask Salesforce to give you an increase of additional ones, but that, that's not going to be on the test. But if you are hitting that limit, you can, t you can get that one increased. So, yeah, very good. Any other questions on record, or not record types, roll up summaries? The, it also is only available for certain types of fields, isn't it? So like, um, are, you able to, are you able to do a roll up summary on a formula field? Um, I remember that it said that you couldn't do like pick list fields. Um, and some of that. I didn't. You mean as criteria? You, you can do it on formula fields as long as it doesn't go across to another object. Yes. That's what it yes. is. Okay. Yep. I knew there was something, some uniqueness there. That's what that yeah. sounds right. Very good. Thanks. And that applies to the filter criteria as well. When you're filtering, yep. you can have a formula field be a part of that filter, but it, it can't be linked to another object. Right. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, so you can't use long text areas, multi-select pick lists, uh, description fields, system fields like last activity um, or created date and stuff, um, cross objects, formula fields, and lookup fields. All right, good. Very good. Anything else on roll-up summaries? All right, well done, thank you. I have the next one on validation rules, so I will share my screen. And so validation rules. Validation rules verify that the data the user enters in a record meets a standard specified before the user can save the record. So in other words, it helps keep your data clean. Validation rules can contain a formula or expression that evaluates the data in one or more fields and returns a value of true or false. And this is the one here that typically gets us always confused, gets me confused all the time as to which way is which. Does validation rules also include an error message to display 
to a user when the rule returns a value of true to an invalid value. So there's like a whole bunch of negative comments there. Um, so the expression has to be, tell me, and t correct me if I get this wrong, um, the expression has to be false in order for the, to display the error message. Is that right? In order to pass, it has to be false. There we go, I'm seeing all the heads shake up and down, thank you. So I get that confused all the time, if, and that's probably going to be on the exam, so make sure you know that one right. Um, I always just read it, read it on the screen as I do it and let that guide me. Um, all right, three parts of the validation rule that are important to know. The, the first one is the uh, error condition formula. That's the, that's the formula that, you, that we're using to evaluate the actual data. There is the error message that displays for the user when the, when the um, uh, formula fails. And then our error location determines where on the page to display. And you can display that error message either next to the field that it's referencing or at the top of the page. The, the little caveat here at the bottom is one that I, did not, I wasn't aware of, but the error message, um, the error location is set to, if the error location is set to a field that the user can't see or is read only, it will display that error message at the top of the page, uh, which kind of makes sense because the field isn't there for them to see it. So, <laughs> all right, so let's take a look what this looks like. And <clears throat> so we've got an account uh, record here and uh, I've got the account object and we are down here in the validation rule section. And so I've got a simple um, validation rule here that's set up on the phone that says that we have to have a phone number. So let's take a look, look at how that is structured. So we've got our name, we've got the ability to turn it on or off. And here, here's that piece that always throws me. So if a formula expression is true, display the the error message. So I've got my formula here on the phone field that simply says is the phone blank. If it if that results to true, then I display an error message that says that the phone number is required and I place that next to the phone field. Any questions on that? I don't know that how deep they will go into having to know all of the different functions. Um, but one of the things as I was reading is they, they, they definitely, um, well, we'll get into it, I guess, when I go back to my slides, but they want you to keep your formulas pretty concise. Um, and, and there are some rules around which types of fields you use for formulas. So for example, on the opportunity, one of them that they said, um, is to not use the is one or is closed uh, field uh, in in your validation rules, and I think that has to do with the order of operations because those are those are formula fields that are calculated after the the validation rules fire. So your validation rules run pretty close to the beginning of your save process, and some of those those formula fields would not have calculated yet. So be aware of that. And I think I've got that in my slides here as well. So let's test this thing out. Um, it is active and phone is required. So let's simply do an edit. I guess we're gonna do an inline edit because I don't have buttons. Um, and let's save this. Phone is empty. So it does come up saying phone number is required. We'll toss in a phone number. I think I put too many in there. And we'll save that and hopefully now it works. Okay, so that's that's how we set up a validation rule. Oops, wrong button, present. <clears throat> All right, some considerations. Task and events. Those two objects, our validation rules are actually set up on the um, activities object. 
Salesforce processes rules in the following order. So validation rules are going to fire, followed by assignment rules, auto response rules, workflow rules, and escalation rules. So be aware of some of those order of operations because that, that is important. When one or more validation rule fails, all error messages will be displayed at once. So that's kind of a nice thing for users. You don't get one error, you fix it, and then you get a second, you get them all at once. Validation rules are only enforced dur during lead conversion <clears throat> if validation for lead conversion is a enabled. So um, you do have a, a, val a, a section in setup called lead settings that allows you to turn on um, this particular feature. So you have control over having that on or off. Validation rules do not fire when using a ma using mass transfer. So that's good to be aware of. And then there's a lot, lot more of these various considerations. Um, and I'll show you the, the these once we get through the next slide here as well. Um, <clears throat> so there's, it's probably good to read through these because I could see a lot of, a lot of questions that might be answered in some of these different um, considerations for validation rules. All right, so some tips. <clears throat> be careful not to con uh, create contradictory validation rules on the same field so that means you might pass one field but fail on another and you can't get anything to be valid and so you just can't save it. So they always recommend testing. Um, validation rules are a good one to do in a sandbox before you do it in production uh, because it is so easy to get them wrong. <clears throat> a poorly designed validation rule can prevent users from saving valid data. Make sure you thoroughly test your validation rules before activating them. Okay, that seems obvious, but I know if you're like me, we like to do things in production just because it's easy, uh, but not recommended for validation rules. You don't have to begin a validation rule with an if function. Any Boolean error condition expression works. For example, you can use close date less than today. You don't, don't need to do it as if close date is less than today, then true, else false. So you can keep those, keep them very, very simple. Keep in mind that a validation rule can, it, when a validation rule contains the begin or, cont or contains function, it processes blank fields as valid. I did not know that, so that's a good one to be aware of. So for example, if a validation rule is testing whether a serial number um, of an asset begins with, with a three, then all assets that have a blank serial number would also be considered valid. So that one was a, kind of a nice trick question. An error message like invalid entry doesn't tell the user what type of entry is valid. So here they're, they're just making the recommendation that you have error messages that are clear for your user so that they know what they need to, need to do. And again, we've got a link here for um, a bunch of other tips. So those, those are, are these here. So the validation rule considerations. And there's a, there's a nice list here of, of those that might it's a quick read, so it's if you're going to take the exam, it's probably a good one to just go through and just be aware of. Same with the tips for writing a good validation rule. There are several there. So I did not mention all of them. I just kind of picked a few that, that looked like they were of interest. Um, but any questions on validation rules? Oh, questions. Awesome. Going once. <laughs> All right, uh, then we'll move on to Meredith with uh, approval processes, which I absolutely hate approval processes. I'm hoping that one day they take approval processes and get rid of them and they just move it right into flow. If they just make an approval process for flow template, 
it would just be so much nicer. So there you go. That's my that's my my wish list for Salesforce. So maybe they'll do it. Maybe they won't. But go ahead, Meredith. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, I have the approval processes. Um, the agenda is going to be first just the purpose, um, why we use approval processes, then the planning that goes into it, which I think is really important, um, then actually building out, and then the study topics. So um, approval processes allow you to systematically um, track, I'm sorry, systematically track approval of records and they can be single step or complex. Um, it goes through a process of, you know, a user submitting um, a record and a manager can approve it. You can do like a yes or no, um, approve, reject, or recalled uh, is the status. And then you can also do multi-layered. So if you have like a level one supervisor has to approve like a discount of 15% and let's say a 50% discount, it has a little more weight for the business. If you want that senior manager to approve that kind of thing, you can set that up. Um, you can set up criteria, like I kind of mentioned in the example, and then set up user notifications. So, um, the first thing before building your approval process is figure out what's your business use. So um, just using that format, you know, as a sales rep, I need to um, I need to offer this discount to my clients um, so that, you know, you kind of write in that format and think about what needs to be approved. So um, you can use approval processes for discounts like I gave in my example, but um, also in my previous company, we use them for assigned accounts. So these really large clients, um, we didn't wanna just give any rep the ability to be that account owner and cover that account. So we created approval processes where the rep um, could formally request through Salesforce and that district manager could do the approval and they, their users loved it because our users at the time were in the construction equipment industry. So they were in their trucks a lot and maybe didn't have Salesforce or computer open. So they loved that they could just, you know, open the mobile app or open their email and just type a quick yes or no and it would approve that and then the rep gets that email notification. So um, they loved it. Um, then I guess the other things you need to think about through your planning is who needs to approve it. So you'll need to really build out your role hierarchy with managers and all those different levels. Hopefully that's already set up in your org. And then under that user, under each individual user, you'll want to set who their manager is and then the delegated approval if, approver if you want to do that. And then think about um, how you're going to notify your users. Um, do you want to do an email template? There, there's a lot of different ways to do that. So the next one is um, mapping out your flow on paper. So I would formally write out and work with the business talk through, you know, why we're doing this, like I mentioned before that, that statement, and then also, okay, so let's talk about, um, you know, if I put this in and I send it to him or her, she'll get an email, that kind of thing. The last thing you want is for people to complain about getting emails that they don't want, um, or they feel like it's too, too many steps. You know, I think those conversations really have to be had. And so now when everybody agrees on the flow, then you can start doing your building. Um, then you'll want to create your custom fields. So um, within, you know, not only the fields that are going to set that criteria. So let's say that discount field, 
but you'll also want to set that criteria fields like, you know, when the manager proves it, this flips to approved, that kind of thing. And then um, you'll want to build your email templates, and that's going to be notifying the users that it's been submitted and then whether it's been approved or rejected. Um, so then there's a lot here. I recommend like watching a video. There's, I watched a really great one that I want to put in our group chat that he walks through the whole thing. Um, but you can do the standard setup or do a jumpstart wizard. And I did a trailhead. I started doing the trailhead and they use that standard setup. So you're going to select your criteria. So, you know, what records meet this criteria? Who are your approvers? Um, that's where we talked about those key players that we've mapped out in our business process. You're going to select your email templates that you've already built, your initial, initial submitter, so who sends it off, what actions need to happen once that's submitted. So maybe the action is pending approval, then your initial approval steps, your final submission actions, and then that final approval rejection steps. Um, so then this last part that I would walk through are maybe some study topics. Um, and you guys can maybe add more. But first I was thinking, you know, what are the capabilities of approval processes? And so they move a record through multiple users for approval or rejection. Um, the trigger steps for they trigger steps for locking a record, email alerts, field changes, or outbound messages, and then they track comments and approval rejection status of a record. Um, the approver can be a user or queue that sub, that a sub, submitter chooses, a user, users, related users, or a queue set by the admin. So you can have up to 25 users per step. A designated approver. So I gave this little screenshot. This is the user object where we set the um, delegated approver and then the designated would be that manager field. And that delegated, um, the delegated approver, they cannot reassign approval requests. So I thought that seemed like a pretty smart thing from Salesforce. Um, then the ways to approve is through Salesforce on the record. And usually you'll get notified of that record through your mobile, um, you know, through an email with a link or through chatter. So you get like that bell at the top right. But I think all of those have to be set up in the settings. And then finally, the approval actions can be email alerts, creating tasks, field updates, and outbound messages. All right, that's what I got today. So those actions look like they, they are basically the same actions that workflow role has. Yes, yep, that's what that was what it said, yeah. Okay. Very well done, very nice. Any questions on approval processes? They're always kind of tricky to get set up because there's so many different steps um, with the approval process. It was interesting that Trailhead took you through the um, the standard way of building out one versus the the quick start. I never used the quick that jump start one. It, to me, it's confusing. Um, I like I like walking through the the standard. <clears throat> and then a lot of times, what I will do is is just get something created <clears throat> so that I can see it on the screen. At, and because I find it easier to follow once I have it built, I can kind of go back in and edit it and add some of the steps. To me, it's just easier for me to process and see it. Um, <laughs> like when you were saying earlier about how you prefer flow, do you yeah. see like work or do you see approval process, approval processes to flow as workflow is to process builder? Like it's kind of an old school thing. I, <clears throat> I, my gut tells me that they will eliminate this at some point and move it. 
And yeah. if they move it, it'll probably move to flow. I, I have zero insight on that, but yeah, just a gut feel. And so when you, what would make you choose, like if you were given the, uh, you know, a, a customer has like a use case similar, how would you choose one or the other? Um, flow is probably going to give you, if, again, this is all hypothetical, but if, if this was set up in flow as a template that you, you could easily manipulate, then in, in flow, you would have significantly greater capability. Mm -hmm. um, so right now we're limited to just the old workflow actions. Well, if we, if we did that and if, if that was moved into a flow, we could do just about anything we wanted to at that point. Um, yeah. So it'd be much, much greater capability. The challenge I think is with flow is that it's, it's still, it's still a tool that people are learning. And, and so they'd have to, they're making tons and tons of progress on, on making it more friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the introduction of templates there, um, I think could, could potentially set the stage for this to take, to, to move that direction. Again, I have no insight on that. I just think yeah. that it, it's, I, I just kind of watch what Salesforce is doing and, 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 and common sense kind of tells me, I bet they're going to eventually move this. Um, and the fact that, that, you know, approval processes haven't been touched in years. It's been this way forever. And, you know, it used to have that visual um, that, that uh, was created with Flash that showed you the path in which everything went. They've pulled that out because of security concerns with, with, uh, with, um, flash and so so I, I i don't know i just could see it happening probably it wouldn't surprise me if it doesn't happen in the next year or so one of the last projects i worked on around approvals i did in flow i didn't you, even you look build at, a, you build yeah, i didn't a, even look at approval processes <laughs> mostly because our use case was pretty complex uh -huh. um and i don't i don't even know if i could have been able to do it in uh, an approval process anyway but i i just went to flow first yeah, and I've seen I I've seen people use Flow to trigger approval processes. So you know they have all kinds of other business logic going on in the Flow, and then it hits a certain section that then kicks off a, a, an approval process. But it's it's still kicking it back to the this standard one that we see. So yeah, interesting. Any other questions or thoughts on approval processes? Are really anything that we've talked about to date? Uh, are you, is there, we've got plenty of time here yet on our call. So is there anything that maybe you have as you've been studying or even in your work situation that you are struggling with and trying to determine how do you go about resolving? Because we've got Carla on the phone and she's very smart. And she, <laughs> she can answer any question. <laughs> Tanner, do you have any questions for Terry? If you gotta, <laughs> wanna... <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> all right, you guys are all muted, so I'm going to guess you're okay. <laughs> so I'm going to give you an extra 20 minutes back in your day. And um, actually, let me stop recording, and then we'll go over our assignments for next week. So let me do that.